Hello everybody, this is Rick Tao from my office here at home and we're going to continue with the study on Ephesians and we're going to be in uh, chapter 4 today. We went through 1, 2, and 3 on separate uh, occasions and uh, chapter each and now we're going to continue on through chapter 4. We're going to try to go all the way through chapter 6 as I have time to do it and I'll be on here from time to time and, and if you can check my Facebook page you can scroll down and see them all there. So uh, thanks, uh, Nicholas, for being with us. Patty, good to have you. Uh, just uh, wave at you a little bit there. All right. And good to have Sheila. Sheila, thank you for watching in this, uh, this afternoon. And we'll try. Uh, Rick, how you doing, buddy? Amen. Thought I'd do a little Bible study while we're while y'all go. Uh, Jack McCoy, good to have you. Going to get everybody in. Chris Koontz, good to have you. And uh, we're going to chime in. Uh, just chime in there. Let me know you're, you're with me. And uh, grab your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 if you will, and we'll go through some Bible study here. First of all, let's pray, okay? Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity, God, to share the Word of God with people out on Facebook Live. We just give you the glory and honor and praise. We thank you, God, for what you've been doing in our lives and what you're doing in the church, God. You're saving souls. Lord, you're baptizing people, Lord Jesus. Uh, good Word is going forth, God. Fellowship is going forth. And we know we have an enemy out there, God, and we're uh, going to try our best to uh, do what you said to do and resist him, and he has to flee. And God, now today, I pray that anybody that's listening might be lifted up and encouraged and blessed and touched, and we just thank you for what you're going to give us today in the Word of God. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Uh, turn into Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll read the first two verses. First of all, it says, Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord... Paul said he is a prisoner of the Lord. Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. What he's called you to do, walk worthy of it. People said, well, I ain't worthy. Well, without Christ, we aren't. we're not worthy. But through him, we are. Through the love of God and through the peace of God and the grace of God, we are where he makes us worthy. Uh, walk worthy of vocation wherewith you're called and with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering forbearing one another in love. See, he's God's chosen you and I to be our, his representatives on this earth. And, and uh, in light of that, Paul says there that he challenges us to live worthy of this call that we've been received. The awesome privilege of being one of Christ's very own. The awesome privilege of being a Christian. Walk worthy of that. Live like you ought to so people could see Christ in you and I. That's what he desires for us most more than anything. Uh, that includes being humble, humble ourselves before him. That's the opposite of pride, proud and prideful. We be humble and submissive to him. And then he says we're to be gentle. Well, I know a lot of people don't have a gentle spirit, but I know a lot of uh, some others that do, and I prefer the gentle. <laughs> and I pr prefer gentleness in my heart, in my life and everything, as as opposed to uh, being uh, all uh, bold and and in people's face and all that kind of thing. He wants us to be gentle with each other, okay? And to be patient. Oh my, that's hard, isn't it? Be patient. Someone said don't pray for patience because patience comes through trials and tribulations. But you pray that during the trial and tribulation, Lord, give me patience. Help me to hold on. Help me to stand firm and on your word and on the Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me. Help me to hold on and help me to be patient patiently wait and keep working doing what i can do but patiently waiting on what god can do amen god blesses that and also he's called us to be understanding oh we need to be understand with each other sometimes it's hard to understand what um, uh, god is uh, has brought our way it's hard to understand what god wants to do in our lives it's hard to understand why things happen the way they do and it's hard to understand people but uh, we are to strive toward understanding uh, each other and here's one of the, a biggie. We've got to be peaceful. If we're going to be one of Christ's own, we need to be a peaceful uh, group. In other words, not always contentious, not always stirring up problems and, and strife and, and those kind of things. God wants us to be a peaceful group. Amen. Welcome, Penny and Ellis and Charlie. Good to have you. Amen. And uh, Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're at. And uh, so looking uh, on down into verse, uh, i let my phone just ring. It'll get it after a while. <laughs> Leave me a message if it's important. Okay, so there is uh, one body. We're going to go into a study a little bit here on unity, on the unity of the Spirit. There's one body, Paul says, and unity, it just don't happen, okay? 
we got to work at it. We got to work at being unified. Husbands and wives, you have to work at being unified with each other. It takes a lot of give and a lot of a lot of you know preferring them before us and those kind of things. And for that works on both sides. Somebody said marriage is a 50-50 thing. That's dead wrong. It's 100%. You give all your all to each other. Okay? Once you do that, amen, you're giving your everything to your mate and your companion. Amen. There's no, no you're not going to have these divisions and problems and everything like that. Satan will fight you. Yes, he will. But you will be giving your all to each other. You give your all to Christ first. But all your earthly life and everything, you uh, you dedicate yourself to you, to your companion. And if both of you are doing that, you're doing that in the name of the Lord. And you're going to be doing things like God would have you to do. Isn't that a great thing? That brings unity in the home. What about unity in church? You know, if we uni are unified in church, we're following our leader. First of all, is God. And then the leader God's given us. Good to see, Rob. Uh, all of us who are following God, we're following him. And he is our leader, okay? So we're following him, and we are uh, walking with him. And to having peace in church means we, we share things together. We might have some ideas and opinions. We might uh, feel like we'd love to have something a certain way. But if it don't happen that way, it's no tragedy. You know, work with whatever works. Find out what don't work. Go to the next thing and work at it and find out what does. So sometimes you have to work a process like that to have peace and everything in, in church, so it works out pretty good. Okay, so often differences see among people can lead to division, and but this uh, ought to be uh, ought not to be true in God's church, especially in God's church. Okay, instead of concentrating on what divides us, we ought to remember what unites us. We're part of one body. We're going to stay there here in just a minute. One body, one spirit. One that we have one future. We're going to heaven together. One Lord, one one faith, one baptism, one God. We've, we've got one God of all. We might have our differences in doctrine and differences in how we believe about baptism or whatever it might be, uh, but it, uh, what, uh, it really don't matter uh, uh, to the point of dividing us. Okay? Repent and be baptized for the mission of sin. We're to, we're to give ourselves to Jesus, and give ourselves to God, and to trust in him. So that if we have been saved, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Good to have you, Laura. Amen. Uh, we are working together to be unified in the faith and everything. So we don't need to let anything divide us and uh, split us up. And uh, I wonder, have you learned to appreciate the people that are different from you? It's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Learning to appreciate the differences. I, I had to learn that in, in my home. Uh, Jenny and I are different. We're a lot alike in a lot of ways, but other ways were very different. And I've had to learn how to and I'm learning, <laughs> let me see, let me put it right. I'm learning how to appreciate the differences and think, you know, she's just trying to help me. And sometimes, uh, you know, I've taken it in the past at something she's trying to rule me or run my, my life or whatever like that. But that's not the case. In her heart, she's trying to help. And I accept that help. And I learned to appreciate that help. And we'll try. If it don't work, we'll try it some, some other way, my way, whatever. Uh, so, you know, it really don't matter at the time. And just working together is the way it ought to be, the way it ought to work. Amen. Good to have you, Mike. All right. So uh, uh, when we uh, were studying about unity, you know, can you see the different gifts and the viewpoints that, uh, that can that can help the church as it does God's work? Uh, you know, I don't I don't know everything. I've pastored for 30-something years. I realized very quick, good to have you, Rodney, uh, good, I, very quick, I didn't, uh, I don't know everything, <laughs> you know? I don't know everything. You don't either. And we need each other. And what God gives us, he gives us people that we can bounce ideas off of, people to help us. Rob Trantham, good to have you, but ain't seen you in a while. So we, if, we, if we work together, we're going to have a, 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 a church that's moving forward together. That's where we, the church needs to get, to be moving together. Good to see you, Vicky. Good to hear you. I mean, have you with me. Okay, so uh, can you see that uh, the difference there in how we can learn to appreciate? we got to learn to enjoy the way uh, we members of the body of Christ complement one another. If we can do that, we're going to be uh, we're going to be doing good. So, so uh, no one ever uh, is ever going to uh, be perfect in in our eyes here on earth. Uh, the Bible says there be you know to, the Bible tells us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. But we're never going to be very perfect. Good to have you, John and Valerie. 
Nobody is going to be perfect in this life. So realize that you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. In man's eyes. Now think about this. This is the way man looks at you. You're never going to look at this, this face and this body and this uh, me and see perfection. But I, one thing I think you can see, I hope you, you'll see if you're around me, is to see that I serve a perfect God. And be you perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect. Our Father in Heaven is a spirit. We they worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Uh, we're going to be like Him, for we see Him as He is. We become spirit. So in a spirit realm, in my heart, my heart has to be perfect before Him, or I'm not going to make it to heaven. No sin uncovered by the blood of God, of Christ. No sin uncovered. So people says, well, now there ain't nobody can live a life like that. Yes, you can. With God's help, you can. But with God's help, we must if we're going to go to heaven. Perfect in God's eyes. In other words, we're living a life. If you, it's, it's a life of repentance and staying right with God and everything. If you've done something you know you ain't supposed to do and you've done it anyway and everything, you knew better, repent of it. Pray. Get it right with God immediately. Don't let, and he, his daddy would say, always oh, don't let no grass grow under that sin. You know, uh, Let it uh, take care of it and get it on the blood of Jesus. That keeps us in the realm of forgiveness where God wants us to be. So we're, that keeps my heart perfect before him and right before him. I, I was talking to an older minister one time, and he said, you know, I hope to shout that I have lived some days that, that I didn't sin. Well, if the Lord would come back that day, you know. So, um, you know, you say, well, everybody sins a little bit every day. That's something the devil started. That ain't in the Bible. Let me tell you that. That's not in the Bible. You know, that you have a quota, you've got to sin a little bit every day. No, no way. We're not supposed to sin. The blood of Jesus Christ saved us so we wouldn't sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with our Father. Praise God. Good to have you, Joe and Karen. Uh, you, you know, you need to realize that God is, is there for you. And when you do sin, you get it right with him. And then your heart becomes perfect before God in the spirit realm, you know, not in the, in the flesh like we see. You'll never see perfection in me, and I want you. But God that says our heart has to be right with him, okay? So when we see faults in our fellow believers, we need to be patient, we need to be gentle with them, okay? Be easy on them. Uh, something happens a lot of times in churches when the new converts get saved. Uh, first thing they do is they think they ought to be perfect right off the bat. They think they ought to be straightening up and everything, every thought's right. And everything comes out of their mouth is right. Good to have you, Denise. Uh, everybody that's, uh, you know, everything goes on in their life has got to be like they think a Christian ought to live. Well, if they followed you around, they're probably not seeing that either. <laughs> you know, because we need God's help. We need God's help. So uh, be easy on Christians. Give them time to grow. Give them time, new Christians. Give them time to grow and, and mature in the faith. And then allow them to make a few mistakes and help them through it. Say, well, this is what maybe you should have done or whatever. And don't uh, uh, beat them down. The devil's doing enough of that out there in this world. We don't need to beat each other down, do we? We need to help each other up and be lo loving and caring and uh, be there for young Christians, especially and, uh, as they grow into faith, and they'll be able to help someone else. That's the way it's supposed to supposed to work and everything. So rather than dwelling on the person's weaknesses and looking for their faults, whoever it might be, pray for them. Pray for them. Then even do even more. Spend some time, if you can, getting to know them. And maybe you might just learn to like them, <laughs> even with the differences. You might just learn to like them if you try real hard. And I believe if we try hard, we can do it because God will help us do it. He, verse three says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Again, we're still in Ephesians four, chapter three, endeavoring or working hard at keeping the unity of the spirit. And what binds that unity is the bond of peace. To build unity in the body of uh, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, is one of the Holy, Holy Spirit's important roles that he is a part of, that we need to allow him to help us realize we need him to help us with. He leads, and we have the uh, have to be willing to be led, okay, and then do part, uh, our part to keep the peace. We have something to do in it, too. We have to keep ourselves uh, in the realms of love and peace and harmony. We do that by focusing how? Focusing on God. We've got to focus on him, not on ourselves. For more uh, uh, about that, just keep reading the Bible, uh, all the scriptures in John and Acts and Ephesians on the Holy Spirit. It'll tell you what he's, uh, meant, uh, he's meant to do, what he came to do. 
He says, that which of John 3 and 6 is that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So if you stay in the realms of the flesh, you're going to have problems with people. But if you stay on the realms of the spirit in our flesh, keep our flesh under subjection to the spirit, we will be able to uh, handle people who, who are not like we think they ought to be. Don't walk like we walk, talk like we talk, smell like we walk, you know, uh, act like we walk, uh, act or whatever. We're going to uh, be uh, more accepting of them. And, and, and thank God somebody accepted us till we got it, started getting it right, okay? All right. And verse four through seven said, there is one body and one spirit, <clears throat> even as you're called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So think about this. All the believers in Christ belong to one body. Okay? All are united under one head. That's Christ himself. And each believer has a God-given ability that can strengthen the whole body. Your special ability may seem small or large to you, or you might think it is to others, but it's yours to use in God's service, and it's very important. There's no big eyes and little U's in God's program. Your little work that you do, that you can do, it, it, it's a blessing. It can be a blessing. What little that you might think you could, might could do, it's a blessing to, to the kingdom of God. My, by the way, you bless God, whoever's God's, and God's happy with you. If you be a kind to, to, to people that, that, uh, that God has made that is God's people, sinners and Christians alike are God's people. But uh, his, his bride, his church, is those who've gotten saved. God made us all. So we, uh, the more you are kind to them, the more God will bless you. About. As a matter of fact, the Bible says you know, that um, in as much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, whoever the world considers least, okay, you've done it unto me. So sometimes we need to go to the underdog and help them out and lift them up and encourage them that there might be no schism in the body, that there might be equality, and, and lift up those who are the less comely parts, you know what the Bible says, and those who have all the talent, you know, needs to work with the, those that don't and all that. And so that way we can uh, all be a part of God's kingdom. Everybody's important, okay? Everybody's important, okay? Every believer has something they can do. And each uh, uh, special ability, it may be small or large, but you can still use it. Now ask God to use your unique gift to contribute to the strength and the health of the body of believers. Ask God, Lord, what can you do with my uh, gift that I have? If you can sing, uh, or if you can teach, or if you can pray. I mean, uh, sometimes there's a gift of prayer that comes on, and you are an intercessor in the closet room in your house or whatever for you pray. The church needs you. We need more prayer warriors. We need more people who are willing to hold up the body of Christ and, and pray for the sinners that they'll come to know the Lord as Savior and Lord just like we have. We need prayer warriors, okay? In verse, verse 6 there said that uh, there's one God, Father of all, who's in, above all, above all, through all, and in you all, okay? So God is all over. See, this shows the his overruling care, his transcendence. He's everywhere, okay? He's in all and through uh, uh, all. He li he's living in all, th or living through all. He lives through us. So we show people the love of God by allowing God to live through us. Think about that when you're out in the world. God, I want you to live through me, through your Holy Spirit. Touch through me, Holy Spirit. Touch through me, the Bible says. Uh, that song says, live through me. Love through me, Holy Spirit. Love through me. That's what God wants to do. He wants to do it through you because we are his ambassadors in this world, okay? And uh, so this shows his active presence in our life. Praise God. I want him active in my life, don't you? I don't want just, him just to be an acquaintance. I want him to live through me and work through me and love through me. He becomes an active presence in my life. Praise God. That's what the church needs a whole lot more of. Good to have you, Randy and Roger. All right. So uh, uh, God is over everyone. And any view of God that violates either his transcendence or his eminence, it doesn't paint a true picture of him. Okay. 
So if you've got him up on a shelf in a bottle up here on the shelf somewhere and you can pull it, think you can pull him down when you need him and everything and other, all other times, hey, just let me do my thing. That's a wrong attitude. That's a wrong attitude. That attitude will never lead to success. It'll lead to failure. I'll tell you right now, by experience <laughs> in my life in the past, that led to not success, but failure. But when I surrendered to let him be Lord through me, then that's when things started happening, okay? Praise God. But that God's given every one of us grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. He's given us, every one of us, a measure. The Bible said he's given us uh, the measure of faith, the gift of faith inside of us. When we were born, he dealt unto us the measure of faith and the gift, the gifts that, that we have. He dealt them to us. And if we don't use them, he may just give them somebody else. Yeah. If you are, uh, good to have you, Mike. Mike's a good singer. And I know, if he, and he uses his gift. And if he, uh, if we ever quit using our gift, Mike, and I know you'll agree with that. If you let, we ever quit using this gift, God just may take it away. Might not be able to do it. But I thank God he's using it. And I try to use mine and, uh, and what God has done for us and given him all the glory and the praise and honor for it. Cause he's a great big God. Amen. Verse eight. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now what on earth is he saying to us? Well just like Psalm 68 and 18 said thou hast ascended on high that's where it's all come from. Uh, just uh, kind of restating that, that verse in Psalms uh, 18 and 18 or, or 68 and 18 excuse me said thou hast ascended on high thou hast led captivity captive Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, and the Lord uh, God, that the Lord God might dwell among them. See, God's pictured as a conqueror marching to the gates and taking tribute from, a, from the fallen city. Hmm. Paul uses this picture to teach us that Christ in his crucifixion and in, in his resurrection, he was victorious, thank God, victorious over Satan. When Christ ascended to heaven, he Gave gifts to the church, some of which Paul discussed and in, in, uh, discusses on down here below. We're, we're going to get to about this, uh, the gifts to the church that he has given us. So uh, thank God he loved us enough to give us gifts. Verse 9 says, now he, that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now what in the world is he talking about there? So it's talking about the lowly world. Uh, and two things uh, a writer I'm looking at here said it might be, or three things, the earth itself, uh, lowly by comparison to heaven, or the grave, or Hades. Many believe Hades is a resting place of souls beneath death and resurrection. So however we understand it, Christ is Lord of the whole universe, past, present, and future. Nothing or no one is hidden from him. Thank God. The Lord of all came to earth and faced death to rescue all the people. No one is beyond his reach. I feel like God, when Christ was in the in the tomb, uh, he uh, went uh, down the corridors of heaven, or hell, I mean. He went down the corridors of hell and said, devil, give me them keys. He had, now he says, I have the keys of, of death, hell, and the grave. And he led captivity captive, those that had died before then, and, believe, and believing in God, he, he liberated them, and he took them to heaven to be with him. And now he gave gifts unto, the, unto men. And some of these gifts were fixed and talk about apostles, prophets, and all that. So God gave gifts unto men. He set things in order. He made it right. He gave us what we need in this world to be strong church, strong Christians, to be strong people in the Lord. All right. So uh, verse uh, 10 says, he, uh, he that uh, descended is the same also that ascended up uh, far above the heavens that he might fill all things. When he came to this earth, he came down to do a work, and he did it. And at about 33 and a half years old, he finished his work, and he died on the cross, was resurrected. He went back to the Father. But the good thing about it is he didn't leave us comfortless. He sent, sent us another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And he will show us all things uh, and show us things to come. And he'll lead us into all righteousness. And he'll lead us and direct us. Everything we feel on this earth in our heart is God, but it's the God's spirit. God is in heaven. Christ went back to heaven. He sent us the third person of the Trinity, Trinity the Holy Spirit, back to guide us. Good to have you, Todd. 
and they're good uh, to, be, to be with you. God wants you and I, God wants you and I to know that the Holy Spirit is with us. He's here to help us, okay? Verse 11 and 12, here's, here's the gifts that he, that he gave the church right here. And he gave some apostles pro, uh, 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 and, and some prophets and some evangelists and some uh, uh, pastors and some teachers. And here's why he gave them. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. That's why he gave it to us. And verse 13 goes on to say, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. These are the gifts that God has given us. See, our oneness in Christ, our, our unity with him, it don't destroy our individuality. We still are, are individuals. The Holy Spirit's given each Christian special gifts to build up the church and to help the church. Okay? All right, now that we have these gifts, it's crucial to use them. I mean, why, why give, good to have your, why in the world would we uh, take these, receive these gifts and not use them or not give them and not share them? We have a gift to share, not to just enjoy ourselves. It's a, it's, it's a body gift. It's to bless the body with and to encourage the body of Christ with. Gifts that you, uh, God has given you, okay, to build up the church. Now that we have these gifts, we've got to use them and uh, are, are you spiritually mature? Think about this. Are you exercising gifts God's given you? Have you done that? If you know what your gifts are, look for opportunities to serve. You know what I say uh, just about every day, if I think of it, I say, Lord, let my path cross today with people that I can bless, that I can be uh, uh, show the, the Lord strong to, that I can help, that I can be a, a, a help to. And whatever I do and wherever I go, the Bible said go into all the world and preach the gospel. I go into all the world and share the gospel. And that's in your circle, wherever you run every day, wherever you go, that's your world. And that's where God will hold us for account accountable for sharing the gospel with. And I know it's hard to stop and talk to everybody, but God will make opportunities, you see, especially if you pray that way. He'll make an opportunity for you to talk to somebody about the Lord and show them uh, the way to, uh, to the cross and everything. Okay. So uh, perhaps God will show you somebody you can minister to or a Christian friend you might can be a help to. And then as you begin to recognize your special area of service, use that gift to strengthen and encourage the church. So uh, you might not say, well, I don't know of any gift I have. Well, can you talk on the telephone? Can you? you got a gift. Call people. Maybe people you know that haven't been in church a while. Maybe, maybe somebody you know is going through something. Say, hey, you know, I just wanted to tell you I was thinking about you and I love you and I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. You, uh, you crossed my mind today. And if there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. And uh, if you just love to talk, you know, let them know. Let them, let them know you care. That's a ministry. You just reached out. That's doing the work of an evangelist. Reaching out to God's people. All of us. Have been have had gifts. Some of us are chatterboxes. We like to talk. <laughs> I got the gift of gab, and when you're around people, talk to them, share with them, let them know something God's done for you. Make a testimony of it. That's how you tell, lead people to Christ. You testify first. Man, you ought to you ought to just know what God's done for me. Let me tell you what something God did for me, and then and it'll start touching their hearts as the Holy Spirit touches them, and say, Man, do you know the Lord? Are you saved? Are you do you have you been forgiven? And they say, well, maybe I did back so I said, well, how are you now? Are, are you serving him now? Good to see you, Chuck. How are you, sir? Are you serving him now? Then if you are not serving him, uh, you can't say, well, you know, I've, I've been slack up. But then how about, wouldn't you like to get right with God right now? And wouldn't you like some of this good stuff to happen to you? Amen. So then you lead them in, 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 in prayer and help them to find their way to Calvary and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I need you. I've been lost a long time and I need you. I need your help. I can't do this without you. I can't have any peace without you. The only real peace that I have is in, is in Jesus Christ, the old song says. And if you are living without that peace, <clears throat> you're living way below your privilege. <clears throat> God loves you enough to give you the peace that you need, but you got to want it. You got to ask for it. And then you got to receive it. Simple as that. Yeah, he'll do that for you. Okay. 
All right. So uh, verse 13, uh, 12, 13, it talked about, say God's given the church an enormous responsibility as well to make disciples of every nation. It says that in Matthew 28 and then the Great Commission. It involves preaching and teaching and healing and nurturing and giving and administrating and building and many other tasks, all of it. Uh, I, I've always said we all we do, we do all that we do because we want to bless the kingdom of God and help people find their way to Calvary, find their way to the cross find their way to Jesus Christ, to make it to heaven. Good to have you, Wendell and Carol. All right. So uh, uh, all this stuff needs to be done. And, and we, if, we, uh, if we had to fulfill all of this as individuals, we might as well give up trying. We can't do it on our own. It would be impossible. But God calls us to as members of his body, you see. And some of us can do one task and some can do another. We work together. Some things one's good at, other things are not. Some things others are good at that they're not. And, and God um, makes increase of the body, he says, in all of that. But God calls us as members, amen, to do what we can. Together, <clears throat> we can obey God more fully than we ever could alone. Think about that. It's a human tendency to overestimate what we can do by ourselves and to underestimate what we can do as a group. People will think, well, I don't want to be a part of that group. They don't do it like I want to do it anyway, so I just do it myself, and you'll fall on your face a lot of times. I mean, if nobody's doing anything, for goodness sakes, yes, do something. But sometimes we, uh, you know, we get out on our own when we would be so much better doing things together. And if you're doing it together and for the same cause, same purpose, and the same love and the same unity, everything will work out. God will bless you, and he'll help you and everything. Uh, but uh, the body of Christ, we can accomplish more together when we dream uh, more than anything we could dream possible by working together working together the church can express the fullness of christ it says it in uh, back in chapter 3 verse 19 and uh, verses 14 uh through uh, uh 16 says uh and this is why he gave us all of these gifts okay i always like to say uh, why right here why did he give us that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, verse 14, Ephesians chapter 4, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speak the truth in love, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which ever joint supplieth make an increase to the body under the edifying of itself in love. Now, there's a lot said right there, okay? But let's break it down. See, Christ is truth. And the Holy Spirit that guides the church is the spirit of truth, okay? Satan, by contrast, is the father of the lie. All father of all lies. See, as a father of Christ, then, we got to commit to the truth, okay? This means both that our world and our words needs to be honest. What we do in our words and how we act needs to be honest and our actions ought to reflect the integrity of Christ that we have inside of us. Speaking the truth in love is not, all, is not always easy. It's not always going to be easy. Some things, uh, sometimes you want to dance around the truth a lot, but speaking the truth in love, some things don't need to be spoken, period, but when, when it's time to tell the truth, it needs to be spoken in love. Say it in love. It'll be a whole lot more received if you, instead of coming down on somebody, if you say it in love. They'll receive it a whole lot better, knowing that you've got their best interest at heart. They might still re reject it, but it's their choice. But they'll more, more than not, they will accept it because you are doing it in a spirit of love, okay? All right, it's not always easy. Sometimes not always convenient to speak the truth in love. And sometimes it's not always pleasant. We have to say things that we really would rather not say, but God has told us, and we've shared the truth of the word with them, and it, it speaks right to some issues sometimes. All right? Uh, good to have you, April, and Michael, and Gary. All right. I'm glad you're on board. We're in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're at verse uh, 15 and 16. See, in describing the mature Christian, Paul says that one of the marks is marks of a Christian is the ability to speak the truth in love. Sounds so simple, but it seems so hard for us to do sometimes, doesn't it? So simple, but so hard. Okay, some of us are fairly good at speaking the truth, but 
we forget to be loving sometimes. Some of us are good at being loving, but we don't have it in us to level with, with people and tell the truth, and, and, and that's kind of painful. But the instruction here is to do both. It's to do both of them, okay? Speak the truth, but do it in a loving manner. Think of the of trouble we'd spare ourselves if we followed that practice, if the church followed that, that practice, especially in the church. When you have a problem with another believer, don't go to someone else with it. Go directly to that person and speak the truth of love. See, that's uh, what happens a lot of times. We get, everybody thinks, well, I've got a, you know, I've got a confidant I need to, sh confidant I need to share some things with. I need to tell them about certain things and everything. And so we, uh, <clears throat> we want to uh, share uh, some juicy piece of gossip with somebody is what it amounts to. And we, uh, uh, we, we get it out and stuff instead of going directly or straight to that person in private where nobody else can talk, uh, hear it and share with them what you need to share with them. Don't make it a, a something you've told everybody, uh, several people first. If you got an order against that brother, the Bible says go to him with a spirit of love and meekness and hope that you'll win the brother. Then if they don't hear you, if they're overtaking their fault, not necessarily, by the way, uh, you know, you, uh, you take another one with you. Maybe hopefully somebody that they have confidence in that maybe might win the brother. And then if they don't hear them, then bring the need before the church and ask for prayer for the church. And if some from the church can go and, and, and if, the, if they don't hear them, then the Bible says to treat them as a heathen man, the public and not, not quit praying for them, but just disfellowship yourself from them for a little while, while the God is working on their heart and while the devil is trying to have his way with them and everything until they decide that they really want what you're giving them, okay? In other words, don't get yourself bogged down in a, in a hog wallow somewhere, you know, in this stuff, but just do what uh, God said do. Go to them in private, okay? Most of the time, most of the time, I've noticed if you go to somebody in private, they might not even accept it right off the bat, but they'll come to you later and say, you know what, you was right, and I appreciate you coming to me like you did because you love me and you care for me. That'll make the, all the difference. If it can't, can't happen that way, it ain't going to happen with you or whatever. So we need to just let uh, people know we love them. Okay, some people fear that they'll make a mistake and they'll destroy their witness for the Lord. Think about that. They see their their own weakness and they know that uh, uh, many non-Christians seem to have a stronger character than they do. Well, what do you do about that? You need to pray. You need to pray and ask God to strengthen your... Before you start helping somebody else, you need to make sure you can help yourself and make sure you're, you're where you need to be with God and let God help you, okay? Make sure you're right. Then you'll have the strength and the power and the anointing uh, to go to help someone else, okay? So how do we grow more and more like Christ anyway? How do you grow, okay? Let's talk about it. How are we going to grow in Christ? Well, the answer is that Christ forms us into a body, into a group of individuals, talking about the church now, that are united in purpose and in their love for one another for the Lord, okay? We've got to be united, be together on it, okay? If any individual then just stumbles, the rest of the group is there to pick up that person and help them, help him or her walk with God again. That's the joy of being in a, in a fellowship, in a church, and being apart. Nobody wants to join a church anymore. They're afraid they can't get out. Well, you know, things happen. I know that. But when people want to, I've found out when people want to go, they go anyway. Okay? So don't be afraid to join up with a, with a local fellowship where you're getting your soul fed. And it makes a bond, a unity of believers that will help you grow. And as you grow, there everybody's growing. And then we'll be more apt to help the world out here. Okay? And uh, we reach out to them with what God has given us and what we know, okay? So reach out to them and let God help you. See your own weakness. Get it under under control, okay? If any individual stumbles in, you know, and I've, I've stumbled before, you've stumbled before, we had somebody around us to pick us up. I remember when I was a teenager, I hadn't been saved too long, and I got a little upset one day, that old, my towel temper. <laughs> we always blame it on pa towel. <laughs> But it's my own temper now. I've owned it, okay? And uh, and I got a little mad, and I uttered a few adjectives and said a few syllables I shouldn't have. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, used some language I shouldn't have, and I thought, well, I blew it. And I backslid on God. I just quit. 
and stopped going to church and everything. And by, I, there was no one there. And I was at a good church, but they just didn't realize what was, you know, that I wasn't even there for a while, I guess, because they was busy, you know, enjoying the Lord themselves there and all that kind of stuff. But good people, I don't, I don't hold you know, anything against them about that. But uh, uh, there was no one there to say, Rick, man, you can get forgiveness. Ask God to forgive you. You've not bit the bullet. You've not, you've not <laughs> struck out. You, it, you know, Peter, <laughs> God told the, 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 the disciples, he said, go, or tell Mary, he said, go t- my, tell my disciples and Peter. Make sure you know Peter gets another chance at bat. Let, make sure Peter knows that he has not bit the big one. Make sure that he knows. He denied me, yes, but I forgive him. And he's got a chance, another chance here. So um, realize you have another chance. Realize other people do too, okay? All right. So let there be a restoration, okay? Let, let there be a restoration. If a person sins or he or she can find restoration through the church. See Galatians 6 and 1. It says, you know, brethren, if any man ever be overtaken a fault, you who are spiritual, make sure you're in the spirit when you do this. Restore such a one. If you are in the spirit, there'll be restoration. Okay, if there wasn't restoration, somebody was out of the spirit somewhere because this is a promise of God, uh, Ephesians 6 and 1. I know it's got to work with their will too, but you got to give God time to work too. But if a man will be overtaken or fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Not coming at him with a sword, but in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Don't let anybody drag you into their sin. Make sure you're strong enough. Somebody said, yeah, go if you got enough Holy Ghost. <laughs> if you got enough spirit inside you to not take over, uh, let the devil take over you, okay? All right. So speaking the truth of love, may grow up, verse 15, and, and uh, all things. Uh, may, uh, let's see. Uh, verse 15, speaking the truth of love, may grow up into in, in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole bodily fitly framed together and compacted by that which ever joint supplies, according to the effectual working of the, uh, the measure of every part, maketh increase to the body of the body unto itself in love. So we can make an increase in the body. I want to. I want to make increase, don't you? I want to leave, leave a legacy behind me that said, you know, Rick Tow led somebody to Jesus. Not that Rick Tow's anything, but he gave God all the glory, and it's all for the glory of God that he. He dedicated his life to serve God. They, that's the kind of legacy you want left behind you when you leave this world. They were good Christians, and they led people to Jesus, and they lived their life for the master, okay? So in describing the mature Christian, Paul says that one of the marks is the ability to speak the truth in love. That sounds simple, we've said before, okay? That sounds a, whole, a lot simple. Uh, but then verse 17 goes on to say this, I say, therefore, and testify to the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their hearts. That's why it happens, because of the blindness of their hearts. See, the natural tendency of humans and human beings is to think their way away from God. Uh, they, 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 they try to think themselves instead of just trusting God and everything, they, leaving the, them hopelessly confused. Intellectual pride, rationalizations, and excuses all keep people from God. It'll do it every time. So don't be surprised if people can't grasp the good news. The good news will seem foolish to those that forsake faith and rely on their, their own understanding. They've got to get to the place where the Holy Spirit has gotten them and led them to the part that they realize they can't do it by themselves and they've totally messed it up and they want to change. you got to want to change. Repentance in its simplest form is a change of your mind. You decided, I want to go a different way. Okay, That's the essence of repentance. That's the, what's behind repentance is you've decided that you want to uh, change your route and go a different way. Okay? All right, so uh, the good news, it'll seem foolish to them, though. And uh, people should, uh, uh, should be able to, to, to see a difference between Christians and non-Christians because of the way the Christians live. They ought, to see, they ought to be able to watch you and know, not that you've got Christian wrote up on your head, 
I guess on there I need to go this way. Christians <laughs> wrote on your head. It's, it's not that you have it, the, all of that laid out for everybody. and You've got the, a Christian dress and you've got you know, all this stuff. It's the way you act and the way you live and the way you have your being in Christ. Good to have you, Charlie and Shirley. Uh, it, it's good to, to, to know that you can live a life for God. Live like he would have you do. People know you by the your fruits that you you bear. They'll know your your tree by the fruit you bear. They'll know what you're going, uh, what you're doing by the way you act and the way you carry yourself and the way you react. Not only the way you act, but it's the way you react. I want you to get that. It's not only my actions; it's my reactions. How that I react to things. Okay, that reaction, that reaction means a whole lot. How you react when something happens to you. And uh, do you fall apart or do you uh, get mad at somebody? Do you lose your temper and all this kind of stuff? And we as humans are prone to that kind of stuff. Okay, but where's your faith along about that time? Okay, hold on to faith. And, and I know I'm working at it too. I ain't saying I'm perfected and all that yet. We're working on it. Okay, uh, uh, I have a temper at times <laughs> and I have to work on it. And I have to be careful with that, okay? And God wants me to, to live a life that he wouldn't have me to live, okay? So we're to live full of light, okay? Full of light, praise God. Uh, Ephesians 5 and 8 says, For you, so, uh, you, you were sometimes darkness, but now you're light. And the Lord walk as children of light. So simply walk like a Christian, you know? Paul told the Ephesians to leave behind the old life of sin. Leave it behind. Since they were followers of Christ, you know, he asked his disciples to leave everything they were doing, leave their nets and all, and follow me. You know, some couldn't do it. They had to go do this or that and the other. He said, let the dead bury the dead. You know, just you don't have to say goodbye to anybody. Just come on and follow me. It's nothing you have to do. You have to make a decision that you want to follow Christ. It's a decision, okay? And he will bless you for that decision that you make uh, in him, okay? Living the Christian life, though, is a process. Although we have, we've got a new nature, we don't automatically think all the good thoughts and express all the right attitudes that when uh, we become uh, new in Christ. A whole lot, the way people show where they're at is their attitude. I know that's hard to hear too. I know it. It, does. it hits me right where it counts because I'm telling you, and it counts right here in my heart uh, that, that you know my attitude sometimes is not what it ought to be. Christians can have bad attitudes. you realize that? We can be saved, forgiven, and everything, but we can, at a certain point in time, we're not really prayed up like we ought to, and something hit us, and we got a little upset, and, and we got an attitude, and we're we're a sporting attitude, and we, uh, you know, uh, we pack it around, and everybody can see it, and we're ready to bite and devour somebody, and we snap at somebody, and everything. That's that's not Christ-like. If I do it or you do it, it's not Christ-like. God wants to us to show the love of God. And be firm enough against the enemy and be, you know, stand up for what's right and stand up when uh, something's wrong and all that kind of stuff. Not be wimps. You know, being, being meek is not being a wimp. Being meek is having a heart after God and it waits on God. You know, being a wimp is somebody's afraid to tackle what needs to be tackled, you know, and what needs to be done and not doing the right thing and all that. <clears throat> so let's not be wimps, okay? But uh, if we keep listening to God, folks, listen to this. If we keep listening to God, we'll be changing all the time. Change is inevitable. Good to have you, Kelly. Change is inevitable, and we need change. One thing you can, good to have you, Dream. One thing we can have, uh, we can say about, uh, we can uh, count on is change. <laughs> this world's changing all the time. We hate it. We uh, we like things like they are. We don't like the change. But some some of us, like, uh, some ladies, they y'all like to change your furniture around about every week or so. But um, and uh, most of your men probably don't like that. But a lot of people don't like that. I like a change every now and then. Okay, but uh, I like to know where I'm. What where the my when I come back home, where my head's gonna lay the north, south, east, or west. I know I like to know uh, where my bed's gonna be, and I like to know you know how everything's gonna be. Like it all laid out and, and like it's supposed. To, like I want it. In other words. And uh, not all the time is it supposed to be that way, but it's like we want it. So uh, I want things uh, to, to stay that, but it is going to change. There's change happening all the time. And as you look back over the, this last year, I wonder, do you see a change, a process of change for the better 
in your thoughts or your attitudes, your actions? Have you seen yourself growing some in God? It'd be a good thing to take a little assessment right there. Have I seen some change for the better in me or has something changed for the for the worse? Am I worse for it or am I better for it? Is Do I have more peace about it or am I in, am I in turmoil about it? That'll tell you where you went wrong. If you if you're if you're not where you can have peace and joy and and blessings and those kind of things, if we are uh, uh, went our own way about something or whatever it might be, I'm telling you right now, you need peace. And there, all you need to do is repent. Good to have you, Steve. Uh, is to repent and talk to God and give God your heart. We're in Ephesians chapter four. All right. So uh, you know, although change may be slow sometimes, the, for the better. Okay. It comes as you trust in God to change you, though. It'll come. It'll happen. Trust him. Believe in him. If it's for the good, if it's in his word, you see God's will in his word, you proclaim that will, you can stand on it and trust in it that God will change the situation for your, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll give you a new nature. He'll give you, he'll change your life. Okay. Praise God. He'll change everything in you. All right. So, um, it says, uh, in verse 18 said that they're, uh, uh, having uh, their understanding darkened, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their hearts. See, the devil works to blind us. That's what he does. He works to blind us for what we need to know. Who is past feeling? Have given themselves over to lasciviousness. See, that's what's happening in the world. The Bible talks about lasciviousness here. And I looked that word up, and it means a total lack of restraint. A lascivious person is a person who has no restraints. There's no biblical boundaries. They've let themselves go. They're a lascivious person. That's a, a sinful uh, act. It's a sinful person to allow yourself to go and do whatever your mind and soul and body dictates without the confines of the Word of God, without staying within the confines of this book. This book, amen, tells us how we ought to live. And if we're, we're going to be judged by the words that's in this book, okay, so we want to live like God would have us to live. And if you're living in a, in a way, uh, in your situation, in your life, to where it's not what God would have you to do, then uh, you need to realize it's sin. You need to quit it. You need to change. You need to turn around. You need to ask God to forgive you. Start walking with him. Start reading your Bible, going to church, and, and paying your tithes, doing all the things you know that God wants you to do, and telling people about Jesus and to witness and to them that how God has changed your life, okay? So God wants that out of us, okay? Verse 20, uh, Paul takes a little diversion here. He said, but ye, talking to the church here at Ephesus, ye have not so learned Christ. I know you know better than this. <laughs> See, in a billboard one time or in, on, a, you know, on the internet, it said, don't make me come down there, God. <laughs> we know better. We know better than some of this stuff. We're in the Bible Belt, man. We've heard this stuff preached. We've heard this good gospel preached probably all of our lives much many of us much of us have and if you're living in an area and you're listening to me and you uh, today and you uh, haven't been taught this you you hang on because we're going to teach you and as we come forth with these you look on my facebook and get the first chapter second and third chapter this this will be on there the fourth just keep scrolling until you find it and i'll get the five and six on there soon because god led me to bring out this word in, in ephesians it's a good word but he's telling of Ephesus, you've not so learned Christ. You know, this is not the way I've taught you. Okay? He was their, their children in the faith. He set that church in order. He uh, uh, placed uh, the pastors there. He is the overseer of the, that area and everything. He said, I know you've not so learned Christ. So you know that uh, Christ is not in that kind of sinfulness. Okay? You've not so learned him. If so be that you've heard him, now you have to hear and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So I've led you to the truth in Jesus. I'm leading you listening to me today about the truth in Jesus Christ, okay? So if you've learned this truth, then you're obligated to this truth, okay? And you, this is no way for Christians to act in that sinfulness and lasciviousness and lack of restraints, okay? And in verse 22 said that you put off the former conversation, that conversation means lifestyle in the, in the in the greek and hebrew there's many words that means uh, uh, the one word in the english it means so many different things in in there but at this particular place i looked it up it means conversation means lifestyle 
that you put off your former lifestyle, your former conversation, the old man, the old way you lived, okay, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Back before we got saved, we was corrupt. And if you're corrupt today, you're not saved. You need to get saved or get renewed or whatever it might be. You know, you need to, if you're not living uh, the kind of life God would have you live, if you're corrupt, if you've done some corrupt deeds, you need to repent quickly and get back in order with God and quit doing what you're doing, okay? That's God's mandate. And I know if you struggle with something, center up on that in prayer and staying away from whatever led you there and all that kind of stuff, okay? Now, you put off this old life, this old man, and all the deceitful lusts, and you got to put something on. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's, that's where it's got to start, you see. you got to renew this mind. Was it Romans 12 uh, and 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can prove what God's will is, perfect and acceptable will is. Renew this mind. Renew this noggin right here, this beanie. Renew, renew this thing. Have a new way of thinking. Get the right kind of thinking. Good to have you, Ed. Uh, the right kind of thinking. Change your mind. Repent. That means changing your mind. you got to have a new way of thinking. God will give it to you. And then be renewed in the, sp uh, in the spirit of your mind and that you put on then the new man. Ephesians 4, 24. Put on the new man, which is after God, created in righteousness and true holiness. This new man, this new creature that you are. You are now a new creature in Christ Jesus once you're saved. You're, you've put on a new man. You've renewed yourself. You've been created in righteousness and re, to be in right standing with God. Isn't that good? And in true holiness. That means that the devil has a counterfeit for holiness, but he can't know true holiness. True holiness means you serving God because you know him, not just because you want to you know, make me look good to everybody. Okay, That's false holiness. True holiness is when you're living the Bible life, living the kingdom life like God would have you live. That's true holiness, okay? And that's what he wants for all of us. Our old way of life before we believed in Christ is completely in the past. It's gone. We should be putting it behind us like old clothes we throw away. We get rid of, all ripped and torn. When we decide to accept Christ's gift of salvation, it's both a one-time decision as well as a daily continuous commitment. We made that one uh, that one time, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me of my sin. I accept you as my Savior. Now, it's uh, Paul said, I die daily. Uh, every day we have to walk with God. Do I have to uh, get renewed every day? If you ain't sinned, you don't. But you pray, God, help me through this day. Help me not to sin and help me to live for you. And if we feel like we have, then we come back to God and say, Lord, please forgive me. It's a walk with God, and I'm just going to let God have his way in my life. I'm going to let God do something great in me. Okay? All right. That's my wife. I'll call her later. All right. Amen. And wherefore, putting away lying and speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one body. See, once you get saved, you, it cleans your mouth up. We're getting pretty close to done here. Hang with me. See, lying to each other disrupts the unity that uh, created by creating conflicts and destroying the trust that we have in each other. It tears down relationships and leads to open warfare in the churches. Churches have been sp split right down the middle and splintered and, and blew apart because uh, of the unity that was allowed to be uh, 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 disrupted in, the, in, in all of this. All this uh, 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 lying and speaking e uh, every man, you know, evil to every man. He said, you need to speak truth to your neighbor. For we're members one of another. Good to see you, Faith and Gary. Uh, we're members one of another. So let's live like we are. Let's live like Christians ought to live, okay? I like this one right here. Verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. <laughs> and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, I don't know about you, but I've lived days to where somebody need to shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> Think about it now. Amen. <laughs> If, if there needs to be love, there needs to be working together. But if it can't happen, best thing you can do is just <laughs> quieten down and just go to sleep at night. The Bible says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. I feel like in my spirit that God is saying, don't let a lot of time go by when you've got to ought against anybody, whether it's a husband or wife or whether it's a, a brother or sister or whether it's uh, somebody out in the world. 
that you don't make things right. If you've acted ugly to a sinner, you need to go back to them and uh, make restitution. Say, look, I shouldn't have been there. Good to have you, Alan. They said, I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have done that or whatever. And let them see you repenting and seeing you owning your wrongdoing. And then because you've given it to God and God's forgiven you, you need to ask forgiveness from them. That's restitution, okay, where possible. Sometimes it ain't possible. Sometimes we've done things in our lives, in our early life, back before we got saved, people done dead and gone. Ain't no way you can go back and fix that unless you do something for their family or whatever. So just uh, the idea is you want to get it right, right here. Don't let the sun don't go down on your wrath. Don't let a lot of time go by. Things fester. Things work against the, you and against the church. So that, and talking to the Ephesian church here, that needed to happen there. He said, you need to remember, you've got to not let uh, uh, things fester and let there be unity, okay? We're getting close to the end. And verse, uh, uh, yeah, neither, and in verse 27 says, neither give place to the devil. See, the devil's the instigator of most all of it. I told somebody though one time, I said, we can't blame everything on the devil. The devil didn't make me do everything, just like Flip Wilson used to say. <laughs> Sometimes it was just me. I I was upset. Maybe he stirred the upset up, but it was my desire to blast somebody or to, uh, you know, get mad about the situation or throw something or whatever it was when I was younger. Things that went on in my life and, and all that kind of stuff. Things that are attacking me. And the devil will attack you to try to stir that up if you know he can stir you. Wherever the devil can get at you, that's where he's going to attack you at. Wherever you're weaker at, that's where he'll attack. I've always said the devil enters into the weakest vessel among any situation. Where the weakest vessel is. Sometimes you think they're the strongest, but it turned out they were the weakest at that moment. So don't go calling them a devil, okay? <laughs> but what you need to do is pray for them. Hold them up. The body needs to hold each other up. I, we're not all, uh, uh, you know, on our best all the time. We need help because there's going to be time you'll need help. Okay, so we need to bless each other that way. The Bible doesn't tell us not to feel angry, hmm. but it points out that it's important to handle our anger properly. You got to handle it right. Now let me. We're kind of finishing up with this sort of that bitterness and anger. It points out that uh, it's important to handle it properly, and if it, if it's vented thoughtlessly, anger is vented thoughtlessly. Thoughtlessly, anger can hurt others. And it can destroy your relationship. It can destroy your marriage. It can destroy, uh, you know, your friendships. It can destroy the church if you let it uh, vent it, uh, vent your anger thoughtlessly. Okay, but if it's bottled up inside, it can cause us to become bitter and destroy us from within. So anger is a tricky thing. You know, you got to find a way to vent it to don't destroy somebody else. But if you don't let get it out and get get it dealt with through prayer or something, it's going to destroy you. Okay. Paul tells us to deal with our anger immediately in a way that builds up relationships rather than destroys it. See, you got to deal with it. Don't uh, If you're mad about something, don't stew. Let it stew and fester and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. Deal with it quickly because the longer it goes, the, the worse it'll get. Trust me on that one. I know. The longer you hold something, the worse it will get. I mean, if somebody's done you wrong and people have done me wrong in my past, I've had people tell me, I uh, heard that they said that I'll go down, they'll see me go down, and uh, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, I've got scars, but I'm still here. Yeah, because I give God the glory for it all. He's the one that's helped me through it. He'll help you, okay? If bottled up inside, it'll cause you to be bitter. Paul tells us, deal with it, okay? If we nurse our anger, if we give the devil an opportunity to divide us then. I wonder, are you angry at anybody right now? What can you do to resolve those differences? Don't let the day end before you begin to work on mending that relationship. I heard Larry Lee, I read about him saying this one time. I think I heard him too say this. And uh, he said, <clears throat> I, I just kind of used my hand right here to help me with that, okay? Okay, when, a, when an offense comes, don't nurse it. Don't curse it. Don't rehearse it. Disperse it. God will reverse it. Now let me let me go back over that. Okay? Whenever an offense comes to you, don't nurse it. Nurse it's having a pity party. Uh, you don't know what he done to me. Okay, don't 
Don't nurse it. Don't curse it. Don't get mad. Don't start slinging mud back at them. Don't try to hurt them like they've hurt you. Quit nursing it. Don't, don't nurse it. Don't curse it. Oh, and then don't rehearse it. Sometimes it's best just quit talking about it. Now, what else you need to do with it then? You got all this. What are you going to do with it? Disperse it. Give it to God and God will reverse it. Pretty good thing, ain't it? Don't nurse it, curse it, or rehearse it. Disperse it. God will reverse it. I believe that with all my heart. You're pointing a finger at you like this. You got one trying to see, get you see God, three pointing back at you. The Bible says if you judge somebody that you're doing worse things. So don't keep quit nursing this thing. Get it done quickly. Let God have it, okay? Let God take care of it. Verse 28 through 32, through the end here, it says, let him that stole, now we're talking to the church here, stealing? Him, let him that stole steal no more. Quit it. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Get a job. <laughs> Quit trying to steal. God help us as a church not to steal. And I know it's a big old raw subject here you can get into, but I tell you what, some people, I've known people that quit work to get on public uh, help because it may, they were better off. And we reward people for not working on our tax dollars. Ah, get me off of that. That's a whole different topic. <laughs> but you know that it's the truth. People do it. And people have babies to have a bigger check, all those kind of things. God help them. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for our country that re rewards that kind of actions. But uh, anyway, the church don't need to be involved in any of that kind of stuff. If you're a Christian and you can work, if you can work, you need to be working somewhere. There's a grass to mow. There's a, there's, you know, there's stuff you can do. It might not be what you want to do but until you can get something better. But we need to have the attitude that we need to, to be willing to work. Okay. All right. And in verse uh, 39 or 29 says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. You mean the church talking dirty? <laughs> let no, let no, rather let no corrupt, anything that's corrupt, lying words, uh, corrupt words, vulgar words, corruptness. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. He said, don't let it happen. But, Here's what you're to be speaking. That which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. You want to help people, not cut them down. It's bad if we, I've seen this happen. People talk good about somebody to one, and then I hear them behind the scenes talking bad about them to somebody else. When they're in front of them, oh, man, you're, you're great. You know, that's yeah, wonderful. And then get behind them, tell them how, how much bad they felt about them and didn't like them. Shame on us if we do that. Let me say it again. Shame on us if we do that. That should not be. God wants us to love one another. And uh, the Bible says what goes around comes around. In other words, whatever you what measure you uh, meet on somebody else will be measured again. In other words, it's going to come back on you. Somebody's going to be talking bad about you out there if you talk bad about them. Let's don't do that, okay? Let's not do that. No commu corrupt communication out of your mouth. But that, the, but that which is good to use some edifying and so can minister some grace. People need grace. Tanya, good to have you. Yanni, good to have you. Debbie, good to have you. And, uh, let's, let's, let's help each other. Hold each other up, okay? And not cut each other down. And ver verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit within us is a guarantee that we belong to God. Let's not grieve him. This uh, the way this corrupt communication out of our mouths and all this stuff and uh, being angry and uh, you know not getting into care all this stuff it, it it is something that grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Whenever we're uh, biting and devouring one another, when uh, husband and wife can't get along, think about that. When parent and children, children and parent can't get along, I think it starts at home more than anywhere. And then when church people can't get along, one sits on one side and away from the one on the other side and think God's going to bless through that kind of stupidity. That's what it is, just pure stupidity. That anger needs to be gotten under control. 
You might they might not be the your best dearest friend, but you still love them in the Lord because they are made in the image and likeness of God just like you are. Okay. Well, you don't know what they've done to me. Well, forgive them for it. It ain't worth it. Is it worth going to think about that? Whatever they've done to you, is it worth going to hell over? If it is, wear it out. But if it, I, I, it, it's not. I can tell you right now, there's no problem with anybody on this earth worth going to hell over. Just forgive them. And you, when you know you've forgiven, if somebody said you bury the hatchet, well, some pe uh, people leave the handle sticking out. They'll pick it up whenever they want to and dig it back up. No, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is when you do not hold them accountable for this any longer. Okay? If you don't hold them accountable for it and you cut them loose and you can be around them, you don't have to buddy-buddy with them, but you can be around them and not have a hatred for them and when you look at them, then you know you've forgiven them. But if that's still in there, you haven't fully forgiven them. And the Bible says, if you don't forgive them their trespasses, so important. Think about this. He says, I won't forgive you your, I don't care how good you've been in other ways, I won't forgive you your trespasses because that's sin if you don't forgive. Think about that. Man, that's, that's tight, but, but that's right. James Hobbs used to say it all the time for you. It's tight, but it's right. If you cannot forgive men, what they've done to you. God said, forget me forgiving you. you got to forgive first. And once you're forgiven, you forgive them, then I'll forgive you for what you've done wrong by not forgiving them at the times you did, didn't. did All right? Very important. Very important that we understand that. <clears throat> verse 31. Two more uh, verses. Verse, verse 31 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. Think about that. Let all of that and evil speaking, all this junk I've talked to you about, he says, Paul says, let it be put away from you with all the malice you have at somebody. The, all that malice, you just want to get back at them. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Oh, saint of God, don't be caught up in unforgiveness. I beg you and I plead with you, don't be caught up in unforgiveness. All of us have had things that have been done to us by the world and by sometimes the church. He really wasn't the church, they were just there. If they were hurting you, they're hurting the body of Christ. They're not a part of the body of Christ. They're sinning, okay? But you know the tree by the fruit it bears, but you don't go around and call on them that. But I'm telling you, that that is what that is. Okay? If we're causing problems in the body of Christ and hurting people, instead of edifying and building them up, we're going to pay the price for that. We need to ask God to forgive us for that. Okay? So but some, if somebody's hurt you, okay, quit nursing it. Oh, I've been, I've been hurt so bad. And uh, quit cursing it. Get... Quit getting mad about it. Give the anger to God. Quit rehearsing it. Just quit talking about it then. Give it to God and quit talking about it. And disperse it to God and let God reverse it. He's the only one that can. God bless you, Randy. Good to have you, buddy. God's the only one that can turn it around, okay? And that's going to finish up Ephesians chapter 4. I hope that some of this has blessed you. I hope something that, some of that I've said that has touched your heart and touched your life. And we'll get into Ephesians chapter 5 next time I, I can. And uh, we've uh, taken a job with a, a gospel a quartet, singing with them on the weekends a lot now and stuff. We're going to be busy doing some of that. I'll be in the weekdays uh, and, and stuff here at home and helping the church out and all the stuff at uh, New Life Church of God. And uh, I've stepped down from pastor there last summer. Pastor Greg Sears doing a great job. We love him. We appreciate him. By the way, if you don't have a church to go to, we invite you to come to New Life Church of God. It's on 576 State Route 7 North, Galapagos, Ohio, right across from Quality and the Speedway. And I guarantee you, you'll have the word preached to you. You'll have people that'll love you. And we've got uh, classes for all age group of kids, like uh, whatever. We, and we have good worship and uh, good preaching, uh, time to pray. Anything you need, uh, we can help supply with the help of the Holy Spirit. 
at New Life Church of God. Just up north, the north of the 35 Bridge, right there in Gallipolis, in the Canaga area. The old French Quarter building went from a tavern to a temple. You'll see it right on the right there, a big steeple up there. Come be with us. Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Okay? God bless you. Let me have a quick prayer with you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for all that's listening and everyone that hears this in the, in the future. God, I pray that you'll touch them. I pray that you'll lift them up. Help us to be the church, God. Help us to be the church you've called us to be. Help us to live right like you called us to live, Father. And God will never fail to praise you because you're worthy of all praise. Thank you, and God bless uh, uh, all of our people, of God, and touch them in a mighty way. All the churches in revivals now, give them souls for their labor, Father. And I pray that you'd uh, build up the body of Christ. Let us get stronger and ready and fit for the kingdom and ready for your soon return. And God will give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love you. God loves you even better than I do, okay? God bless you. See you next time. I don't know if I can get this off here. There we go.